This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. All right, I think we're about ready to go. Back there, good. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, thanks to James and Kurt for inviting me to speak with the group. I'm Chris Bowen uh, with Microsoft here in the Northeast, an um, evangelist covering uh, primarily web technologies. So I do a lot of work with uh, client and server side technologies, a lot of HTML5, JavaScript, CSS. And tonight, I uh, wanted to spend some time with you talking about a few primary things. First, kind of an introduction to what this HTML5 stuff all about, getting some understanding about the major parts that we talk about when we are covering HTML5, and then uh, some time looking at how WordPress is moving to implement these features, HTML5, in uh, sites that you can create. Uh, so I'm actually going to defer the WordPress part for a little while until I give kind of the lay of the land with uh, HTML5, and then we'll dive into the templates, the themes that are out there for WordPress, and I'll point out where these things exist in those themes and how you could take your sites today and, and migrate them into adopting some of these HTML5 technologies. Uh, so that said, uh, dive right in. This is how to get in touch with me. If you have any questions, I'm Steve Bowen at Microsoft. I've got some stuff on my blog as well, uh, there for you. You just go to the blog and search for HTML5, uh, no space, by the way. Uh, you'll see a couple things. Uh, one is a, a, a blog post with a whole bunch of uh, resources and links and some slides and stuff at the bottom uh, about HTML5 and some sites that I'll be pointing out today. Um, so it's a good reference if you just miss writing down a site that I mentioned or whatever, you'd like to find a little bit more out there. Uh, there's stuff up there for you already. And for some reason, I'm on Twitter as well. So, uh, so we'll dive right in. And I'm going to shoot for about 8.45 end time, just so you know what to get ready for. All right. If I start waxing poetic about something, just throw a tomato at me and I'll you back on All right. So let's dive right in. I'd like to begin speaking about HTML5 with a slide from a colleague of mine, Giorgio Sardo, and uh, kind of set the expectations around what HTML5 really means. When someone says, are you working with HTML5, do you support it? Uh, well, it could mean a lot of different things to different people. So here's what it means, uh, at least how I'll explain what various people could think it means, and we'll kind of get through it that way. Uh, first of all, we at Microsoft work with uh, a couple of primary bodies in terms of the standards that are driving the next wave of, of web work. Uh, one is W3C, World Wide Web Consortium, and the other is ECMA, which actually stands for European Computer Manufacturers Association. Uh, you can now replace that in your mind with JavaScript. They're much easier to remember. Uh, ECMA equals JavaScript, and these bodies really work with a lot of companies and organizations on evolving the standards in a bunch of different areas. Uh, so chief amongst them are listed here uh, HTML itself, we'll get into each of these as we progress through here. Uh, cascading style sheets for applying, uh, improving look and feel of your content uh, in a separate and maintainable way. Uh, web apps for, really, the goal of these things are to do more on the client side. We can offer more functionality that the browser will support for you, so we don't have to rely as much on server-generated technology, or round trips back to the server, or Ajax calls, things like that, uh, to accomplish what we can do on the client side with uh, really the capabilities of those machines. So uh, that's the focus in that area. SVG is Scalable Vector Graphics, a separate uh, set of standards. And we'll talk about that as well. Each of these things we'll get into in some detail. The thing you can't possibly read is geolocation. It's the other slice of those specs out there. And then finally is JavaScript, which is the ECMAScript 5 specification. Um, and the point of this slide, actually, one more thing. This is the part that frightens small children. So here we go. You ready? <laughs> okay, yep. Find the typo. No, I'm just kidding. There's, 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 I can barely be in this thing in front of it. But the point isn't for you to use this as a reference, but really to get an idea that there's a lot of stuff going on out there. There's a lot of different standards that are being worked on. Uh, so within HTML, um, we've got a bunch of different things with microdata and uh, HTML5 syntax, semantic tags, canvas, things like that. CSS, uh, maybe you've seen it before, you've been working with it. Uh, a lot of things in CSS3 that are moving what we can do as designers forward, uh, taking advantage of more uh, functionality that the browser can offer to us on the client side. Web apps, of course, I mentioned this before, doing more on the client and making it feel more like an installed application, like a regular native application, uh, helping the user to forget that they're on the web. 
which is a pretty good design tool. And also SVG, scalable vector graphics, another alternative for creating graphic content uh, on the web. And geolocation, you know, the spooky kind of cool, you know, we know where you are, uh, you know, kind of stuff. And that's something the browser can help uh, determine your location, if you agree to it, of course. And we can use that for a lot of various purposes on the web. And finally, JavaScript itself. Um, this actually has been set for a little while. It's the first major change to JavaScript in about 10 years. So there's a lot of uh, kind of requests for adding functionality to the language that have surfaced in this spec. And so now, with the latest JavaScript, we can do you know more things with arrays and access and a lot of cool stuff. Um, but again, can't possibly dive into all of this tonight. So I make sure you're aware of all these various things. And I'll answer this question first before moving on. Uh, your chart there shows some proportions. I'm assuming there's a purpose to that. Uh, uh, I think it's just to match up with the, the various specs down here. Don't don't imply, don't infer any kind of importance or uh, number of companies or efforts. So it's not that based on what's going on in CSS, CSS and HTML. No, I, I would never say that CSS has you know more than one or the other. It's just how these things kind of boiled into different subgroups here. Um, by activity, you're going to see probably a very disproportionate uh, ballooning of, of each of those groups. Um, the other thing to point out, though, is not the fact that there are so many of these things, but that each of them is kind of in their own state of preparedness. Of each of these things are being worked on as a standard. And that means getting one you know, around the campfire and singing the same songs and stuff like that. And when everyone's agreeing on that kind of stuff, making it a candidate recommendation and then finally a formal recommendation. Um, at some point in that spectrum, really any point they want to, browser manufacturers can decide, oh, we're, we're all set, we want to go ahead and implement this. This is both you know, the cool thing about the web, and it's also the challenge for us, is that these, these features can pop up whenever a browser manufacturer is ready to dive into it and support it. Um, so our, our view with Internet Explorer tends to be a little more conservative. We look at the features, we try to determine the ones that are essentially more stable. Uh, that are least likely to change at a, at a coding level. Uh, so if we publish, if we, uh, if we have support for a feature and our customers write code to that feature, is it likely to change out from underneath them? And that goes into determining when a feature will get into Internet Explorer. Uh, that combined with the relative usability, I'm sorry, the use usefulness of that feature, uh, kind of the combination of those things go into really weighting each of those things. That said, everyone has their own uh, view on when things could go into a browser. We're going to get into this a little bit later on because the reality is that not everyone's running the latest version of the latest browsers, of the, and even then, not all of those browsers support everything you see here, plus all the new things that have popped up since the slide was made. So, how do we deal with that? I mean, we know what the features are. Can I use them today? The answer normally is yes, actually, by the way. Um, and how do we deal with the fact that not everyone hitting our site is going to have the latest and greatest? I'll definitely cover all that ground if you're going through content. Where, where is Flash on there? Where, uh, where would it be? As uh, something else. Uh, <laughs> just you know, there's other kinds of plugins. There's other kinds of technologies out there that um, maybe are based on what a, a, a company wants to do or wants to support, or it could be based on another standard. Um, this is really just focused on the web standards as defined by W3C and ECMA, which are the groups that we work with very closely. Um, an entire session could be spent on history of the web and standards and the web working group, IETF, and all kinds of other groups that are out there pushing standards. Um, this is just kind of our view of things. And it's a pretty, pretty common view amongst uh, you know, web designers looking for what the latest uh, standards are out there. Now, that, like I said, there's just keep on skipping about how the relationship works with the web working group and things like that. You know, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. It's just not something we have time for. So let's dive in and start taking a look at the actual stuff that this, uh, these standards are helping to support. The first thing to focus on, though, is actually making an HTML5 web page. What are the components? How do I, how do I tell a browser that what I'm uh, sending out as a page is HTML5? Well, this is not HTML5, by the way. This is our starting point. This is the next HTML page, uh, kind of the stuff we would do before HTML5. I want to walk through how this would migrate or morph into an HTML5 page. So start at the beginning, we have uh, you know, your basic structure of a page. Doc type tells the browser what to expect, so the kind of content that's being sent down by the rest of the page. And then you get into the actual HTML. A head section, and then a body section, uh, the HTML itself. Now this is how it begins to morph. In HTML5, it's refreshing. 
it's actually one of those things that as things advance, it gets simpler. So in this case, the doc type actually gets truncated down to just that. Uh, it turns out that's the, the smallest doc type that can reliably trigger standard mode in all major browsers. So this is great. So now I can use this. I don't have to remember it. I don't have to copy and paste it in from my other pages because no one could ever memorize the namespaces in uh, XHTML or 4.01. Uh, so that will say to the rest, to the, to the browser, expect HTML5. Expect standards uh, and support it with standard mode for all the features that I'll be plugging in. Now, the, this is actually the cheater's way out of this is to say, well, it's HTML5 now. It's actually true. By just changing the doc type to that, it's really an HTML5 page. But the interesting thing about HTML5 is that it's up to you to determine how much of it to use. So if you haven't used any part of it, is it really HTML5? We haven't used any semantic tags. We haven't used any of the other features that are out there in terms of standards. Uh, so while it is an HTML5 encoded page, it's only as much as you utilize it. So a lot of folks ask, well, how do I take an existing HTML site and make it HTML5? It depends. How much of that stuff do you want to use? The good news is it's very backwards compatible. So the things that I can work with today in an HTML5 context should continue to work. The question is, how much of that stuff do you want to change to take advantage of the new things? Because um, if you don't, well, there's really no advantage to switching to HTML5. Right? So yeah, keep this in mind. That's the easiest way to get an HTML5 doc, but it's, it's only the cheater's way out. It's not really the story we want to talk about. So let's keep going. The other things that get easier, the HTML tag itself, we don't need the namespace there anymore. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, also, for your content, uh, to, to denote what character set you want to use is important for encoding, uh, especially if you're, you're localizing or, or globalizing your content and using other character sets, you know, Cyrillic or you know, some kind of uh, uh, other other language that you want to support um, that uses a different character set. You just have to type it out kind of in longhand this way. Now it's pretty much just car set equals whatever. The other thing to point out, you probably want to add a language encoding to your HTML element as well. This is helpful for accessibility. Um, so if a, you think about a user hitting your site, perhaps in a non-traditional uh, browser, an accessible browser that's reading content to them, uh, if you've encoded it with the wrong language and you are supporting multiple languages, or perhaps they have a default of French and they're coming to your site in English, um, the readers will, will do their best to take that content and, and speak it for them or in other words, represent it for them. But if it's misencoded, it's not going to do any favors for you, that user. Um, so it's a very small thing for us to do. It turns out it can have an important benefit. Uh, we're going to get into more about what you can do to help uh, people hitting your site with accessible browsers. Uh, this is only the beginning of that, but keep this in mind. This is actually not necessarily the smallest page you could use for HTML5. It's the smallest one I would tend to use. You could actually omit a few other things here, and browsers will tend to put that stuff in for you, and it's pretty reliable. Um, I don't like to take chances with a lot of stuff, so this is what I would use for your basic page, and we'll build on that from there. Okay, any questions so far? You can get to HTML5 right now, though. Okay. All right, so we'll push on. The first thing to point out is probably the most frequently spoken about uh, thing in HTML5 is semantic markup. And it's a very, I don't know, it's kind of a vague term. The idea is just we want to um, provide meaning for our content. It's really what it is, just defining the intent of different parts of our page. Before, and I think Jeremy Keith had a, a phrase around this, he says it's basically paving the cow paths of how we do things on the web. So we've been doing this kind of stuff for forever on the web. You have content, you have a header, you have footer, you have uh, navigation around your site. But the way to identify that is usually done with, with divs uh, and spans and stuff like that, with the class equals navigation or nav or whatever. Now that works, right? It's, it's fine. It, it's a great way to apply CSS and other kinds of, of content, uh, look and feel to your content. The problem is it's non-uniform. It's not consistent. So what happens is it turns out there can be you know, umpteen ways of saying navigation for your site. Navigation, nav, directory, dear, links, uh, whatever it could be. And those things have to be known in order for, first of all, an accessible browser to know what to do with it. And second of all, for search engines to know how to categorize that content. So it's doubly important that we come to some kind of consensus on how we organize and identify our content. And that's really how these things came about. It was through analysis of just really what's being done out there today. I said, well, these are really common class names out there for defining intent. Let's make them tags. 
Great idea. All right, done. That's the first part of HTML5. It's really just making things that were already being done part of the, the language itself. Now, you can pretty much understand what a lot of these things do for you uh, just by reading them, and that's kind of the good part. They're already being done, and they're being done because that's kind of the intuitive way of categorizing content. So we can look at these, with a few exceptions, um, you can tend to understand what, what things mean. Header, footer, these things are kind of obvious. Nav, your links, uh, and they put in some context here. This, this actually shows you a little bit more of a, the, the common web page, or a blog, or a news site, tends to have a structure kind of like this. Now, when I'm pointing out these links, why don't you keep in mind, semantic tags and tags in general in HTML shouldn't imply anything about how the content will look. It should only describe the content. It should only give structure to the content, and, and in this case, context and meaning. The way we would make the page actually look is it, we would define that through CSS, typically. So I would say, here's the header for my content. Uh, here's you know, about our site. You know, our, our corporate logo and stuff goes up here. It doesn't have to go here, though. It may be the first thing in your content, but CSS might step in there and say, nope, take that, rotate it 90 degrees, and stick it over here on the right side. Totally fine. That's totally, it's entirely in CSS, uh, typically, because it's maintainable that way. So this has nothing to do with structure, with look and feel. It's all about what do we mean by the content that is in these various tags. Okay, header, footer, we got it. Uh, aside is stuff that tends to be related to the content, but isn't terribly critical. You could actually probably drop it and the core meaning of the article is still intact. The other thing is nav, and this is important thing to point out. Don't immediately run out and take all your content, all your links on your page and put it into a nav. Nav is for one specific reason. It's for links that will navigate around and within your site. Okay, it's to help a user you know, migrate around and navigate around your, within the various sites. So about us, contact us, uh, you know, things like that, uh, news blog, things like that are, are sections of your site. Links to those would be in a nav. Links to related information about a, a post or something like that is not nav. It, it's important because of that thing I mentioned before about accessibility. Now a person using an accessible browser can say, I don't want to read the page, I want to find the quickest way of getting me to the page that I want. So it's going to ignore everything on the page and read out the nav links to that user. And then they can just, you know, they can say, you know, free and then go right to the right place they want to go to. If they want to read the content, it can skip that nav and just focus on the article. It's a small change for us, but it's a big impact for accessibility. It's an important thing. That we have this, this consistency now that's really great. And the other thing too is, you know, for the, the Googles and the Bings and the things like that of the world, they can look at this content and say, well, assuming they're using the tags correctly, this is what they must have meant by the content. And let's go ahead and categorize it appropriately. All right, that's whenever someone says HTML5 and semantic tags, that's the story. That's why it's there. And are there any questions? We're going to see this in WordPress in just a little bit. All right. So this is strictly informational for the search engines. It's not transactions. <coughs> it's not activating. Typically, it's it's not going to have any effect on. It's not going to have a noticeable effect on the consumer of your page. It's really more about an, a blog. Sorry. A, uh, or an engine uh, looking at the site or the actual browser itself uh, gives it more information to do a better job of presenting that content. Uh, but it's not, if you go through and, and take all your content and your divs and your classes and migrate it over to this, it's not like your site's going to show a difference. Uh, but there will be an impact in search engine optimization and accessibility as well. And maintainability as well, because another person could come through here and over time as these semantic tags become more familiar, they could say, oh, all right, I get it. This is what they meant. This is what everyone means when they use this. Less guesswork. On well, SEO, if, if one site is done in HTML5 and another in earlier version, will the site in HTML5 have a bit of an advantage with search engines? I, you know, that's the thing about search engines. They don't really talk about the rules that they're following in terms of how they would prioritize things. You just have to assume that over time, the HTML5 approach will will take hold and make it easier for search engines to do a better job with less guesswork. I think I think it's safe to say now search engines have really complex rules around. Well, if it's one of these 30 class names, it's probably something to do with information about the company or about the author, things like that, and they can typically have a good way of ranking those. This takes that guesswork out of it in many cases, and I think over time will help relevancy. But I don't know that it has any immediate impact on you know which one's better right now.
That would be an internal question for those companies, for those, those teams. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, is this uh, like the layout for on a page for the whole site? Or is this, you know, are you grouping all these things in this one area? Um, on a page, but it's going to allow it to uh, fulfill the whole site? Gotcha. Um, this, this could be how your entire site looks. This could also just be isolated to one part of your site. Um, this is a page level construct, so um, you, know, you could define this in a master template and use that all over the place, or use it for any time you're trying to show an article or, or, or syndicated content like that. Maybe you want to use a structure like that. Um, without going too deep into things, there are some new things in CSS that may also be appropriate for those kinds of... Uh, CSS regions is a new technology that lets you do much of what you're, you're wondering about. Um, defining areas of your page that the content can flow into in a in a in a defined way that you can share across different parts of your site. But in this case, it really is page by page. You could of course that, that use to replace each page basically the way you set up yeah. per page. Yes. Okay. All right. So there a question in the back over there? Yeah. I was just wondering if there's a consideration for like, advertising as a special section. Uh, in terms of a tag uh, to define yeah. it. So that I guess yeah. you get more easily excluded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I haven't seen. Um, I haven't seen one. I, I suppose there's the nice thing about the standardization process is that all the dialogue is public. I mean, you can see the discussions, and I'm sure there was uh, more than one discussion on the merits of an ad tag uh, out there. So I'm sure it was discussed. I don't know what the resolution was. I mean, it certainly doesn't seem to be an, an element today. Maybe it's something being considered, or maybe they had solid reasons for saying. Why don't we just call that, uh, you, know, art, you know, article or whatever they're they're folding it into? Okay, good. So that's semantic markup. We move ahead here and talk about some other HTML5. Um, kind of along the lines of paving the cow paths comes the idea of there's so many web pages out there that either want to uh, play audio or show a video, and up until now, I mean, really a lot of the story with with showing that kind of content or playing that kind of content was to have a plug-in strategy, to use something from a third party that the browser didn't natively uh, include. And you know, everyone said, well, this is done so frequently, why don't we have the browsers just take care of that for us? So the browsers can supply that functionality, and we can just use common tags and common syntax to get that functionality without having to do anything special or get someone to install anything beyond the, that modern browser that supports this stuff. So that's what leads us into the discussion of the audio and video tag. Um, and it's, it's kind of a straightforward story in terms of the syntax. Uh, there's, there's details though that we're going to get to here. Uh, so if you look at the syntax here, yeah. there's an audio tag, there's a couple of, of options you can apply to it with some, with some attributes here. Say I want it to automatically play, I want it to loop, I want to put in controls so I can pause or, or stop the music. Um, and that's, that's most of the content there. Inside of it though, we have different ways of representing the, the actual content that we want to play. So we have here two source tags. Uh, first one an MP4, and then an AUG format of ostensibly the same, the same song. Now, why do we do this? Well, here's the details. Uh, the, though the syntax has been agreed upon, everyone you know, got around the campfire and agreed, and everyone's all happy, the problem is that not everyone could agree on the various formats that should be used uh, across you know, all these browsers. So, with audio and with video, there is no single format that works across all major browsers. It's unfortunate, it's just the way of things. We're not gonna get into why, but it's just, you know, from our, our uh, perspective as implementers, it's at the role of it. We have to account for it by putting in multiply encoded content to deal with those scenarios. Now in this case, we're saying, look for support for MP4 first. If you find it, go ahead and play this content. Otherwise, we'll keep looking down the list until either we find something that makes us happy, or we fall off the list, and at which point, you aren't going to get anything. It's not going to play any audio for you. So there are charts out there. There's plenty of ways to look this stuff up to see you know, which browser supports which uh, audio and video format. Um, and there are actually some cloud options as well that you can send you a content to a service, and they will mostly encode it for you and give you a tag that you can embed. Uh, to help you to help take you out of the encoding business, um, you know, it's an option too. But really, <coughs> short term, uh, the, the short version of the story here is: yeah, you probably, unless you're on an intranet where you control the browser that's being used, 
uh, you're probably going to want to multiply encode your content and try to reach as broad of an audience as possible. Um, now, the question is, what happens if I fall off this list, right? Um, nothing. It's not going to show anything. Uh, however, if you're in a browser that doesn't know what audio tags mean, there's also a fallback here, too. Um, just as a general rule of thumb, uh, a browser that doesn't understand the tag ignores it. But what happens here, it's going to ignore the audio, it's going to ignore the source tag. So if you had any other content in here, it's going to respect that content if it knows what it is. So an object tag, for example, could be used to launch Flash or Silverlight to then play the audio. And so it's a fallback mechanism that you could use. Alternatively, you could just have like a, some text there saying, we couldn't play the audio for you if you want, you know, here's a direct link to download the song. And you can do that as a fallback mechanism. The same thing is true with video. So let me show you that story too. And kind of the syntax is, is much the same. Video tag, various options. This is just a, one example. There's, there's many different options that you can apply. But again, it's kind of readable. You can take a look at this and get an idea of what's going on here. Um, the things to point out here, poster is a chance to show a picture that will be displayed before the video has been downloaded and, and started to be played. So it's kind of like, just take a representative picture of the content, try to entice the user into pressing a play button, whatever you're trying to do, that'll be shown with that. The other one um, that isn't necessarily obvious is playback rates. Um, one is normal, you know, 1.5 gets the chipmunks and stuff like that, you know, vice versa. Um, to get slower. And then we have the same story with sources. Again, there's no one format yet. You know, maybe we will have one at some point that everyone, that all browsers will support universally. So again, multiple encoding, we fall through that list. Sir? Is there anything like a family, like with, with uh, fonts, this is like a family uh, <laughs> of certain fonts or related type of thing. Is there anything in, in this, such as a family of yeah, it doesn't get any more specific than these types. Uh, the, the, the question, oh, I should read the questions. Um, the, the question is, is there a way to group together and make a family of these various encodings? Are there any kind of like uh, preset, particularly like with WordPress, any preset kind of like family of audio players or uh, you know, audio type files? Not that I'm aware of. You, at this point, you are at the actual um, the codec level. This, this could be an entire session, by the way, as well. So skipping details. It's kind of this level of, of the codec that you want to support that you've encoded with. And that's really the high, the, the deepest revolution you can get to. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you specify the width as 800, but you, not, you have not specified the height. I'm assuming it automatically scales. That would, uh, yeah, it's up to you. Uh, you can let it scale to the content. You can specifically you know, set the scaling in either dimension or go. Uh, totally up to you. Okay. And by the way, I should mention, uh, you don't have to use just the tags to do this. JavaScript can do these things as well. So if you want to have code-based uh, playing of audio or video, JavaScript has APIs to do all that as well. So just options. You can create the content as HTML and then derive it from JavaScript in reaction to uh, you know, events in the application. Entirely up to you. OK, so it's a little bit more about HTML5 content here. The next thing in the actual HTML5 spec is Canvas. It's a new element. And the idea is that it's giving you a section of your page that you can draw in at the pixel level. So we can create content dynamically uh, on the client side using very basic, uh, fairly, a fairly basic API in JavaScript. This is a very interesting thing. Um, the only way you can create content in Canvas is by speaking to the Canvas object with JavaScript. So you might be used to other technologies, like from Microsoft, we have WPF, Silverlight that use XAML, where the story is you have essentially XML that says, here's what I want you to show. Here's a group of things, an ellipse, a text box, stuff like that. And you can read it and pretty much get what it's trying to do in a declarative way. In Canvas, it's, it's the opposite approach. It's you have a placeholder Canvas element in your markup, and then you, you use JavaScript to connect to it, essentially, and then start a conversation saying, please draw an arc, please draw a polyline, or a, you know, whatever kind of, of, of shape you want to create, create a gradient, things like that but it's always through code. The other thing to point out is this cryptic immediate mode thing. What does that possibly mean? Uh, the, the shortest way of explaining it is it's, it's kind of like the character Dory from Finding Nemo, who uh, tends to have not very good memory, and so she sees something, and, and a second later she'd come back and see it again and be really happy to see it, and it's all fresh and new. That's the way Canvas works. Uh, you tell it to do things, and it has no idea how that got there. 
So you say, oh, please move that kite <laughs> over by 10 pixels. It's going to say, uh, what kite? I see no kite here. Uh, because it's, the API is, is immediately rendering out the way we would do that kind of thing, the way we do animations, is uh, typically at the JavaScript level by creating objects and setting properties of those things to say, the kite has an X property. When I set it, the next time I redraw the frame here, uh, the canvas, we'll now have it in another location. So the, the core APIs don't have uh, as much, don't have ways to easily surface those kinds of, of changes. Um, but there are many solved problems in that regard. There's a lot of libraries out there that we can use to, and a lot of approaches that we can use to get that object-based syntax that we can then just say, okay, go ahead and make this change in an object-based way. And that immediate mode will take care of the rendering for you. It turns out it's a very simple API. It's, it's great. Uh, a lot of people use it for animations, for games especially. There's a lot of popular libraries that are based on that. Um, but it is a different way of creating content if you're used to a more declarative approach. Okay. I'll show this to you in a second, by the way. But let me speak about its sibling, though. Oh, um, yeah, so I'll speak about its sibling. So the sibling is SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. Not technically part of the HTML spec, except to say that it's now uh, the ability to embed SVG in your HTML is an option that's been uh, brought to us by HTML5. So, uh, the spec itself is actually fairly old. It's been being worked on for a long time. Um, but now we're seeing support for it. IE9 has offered support, offered support for it now, uh, whereas before it supported VML uh, in, in earlier versions of IE. Uh, so now it's supported just like Canvas. The major latest browsers all support it uh, and support them uh, across the board. Uh, the difference here, though, is the vectors. Vectors, just think about in your mind as, as math. They're just expressions of what you'd like to have drawn. And by that I mean, uh, instead of saying draw these pixels and then those pixels are flipped and that's about it, um, we're actually creating these objects that are part of the, uh, the browser itself, the, the browser's DOM, document object model. So I can say, you know, create this helicopter. It's composed of this line and this ellipse and the following shapes. I can make a group of that. And I can move it just by setting its properties. And it's all automatic. This retained mode that it works in makes it very natural for you to do those kinds of changes. And all you do is just modify the properties and the, the change is immediate. So, I didn't mean to use that word, it's kind of confusing. The change is reflected right away, unlike an immediate mode, <laughs> which interestingly is not the same way it works. So, <laughs> but uh, this is nice because it's very familiar. You can go in here and you can say, here's my content, move that over here, make changes to this, apply these styles to it. Now I say styles. This is actually a really interesting thing too. Uh, the, the things that we create in SVG are also, because they're part of the browser, because they're part of that DOM, they can actually tie into what we're doing with CSS. So if you have rules set up for how to display text or how to do gradients or things like that, we can have those trickle down into the SVG creations themselves. It's fantastically useful. It's really powerful. It's going to help you to reuse that, that one uh, core CSS styling that you're applying across your site that's going to bubble into anything you're creating in SVG. Um, and the other thing to point out, this is not necessarily done with JavaScript. This is, this is done through a declarative approach. So you actually do have an SVG element, and inside of that you have ellipse and polyline and groups and things like that as, as elements in that markup. So there are both ways of doing 2D graphics in HTML5, um, or in, I don't think I ever closed the loop on this discussion, but in HTML5, HTML5 meaning all of those web standards taken collectively. Okay. I didn't mean to skip that part, but um, when someone says HTML5, the purists might only mean that first part of the diagram that I showed you, the, the, the first block. Uh, but most people, most people today mean the whole stuff, you know, everything, kind of the web apps and SVG and geolocation, kind of all those things are along for the ride. So they're a great way to just fire it up, view source on it, and see how they were created. Um, you know, in this case, we only look at SVG, so um, let me see, is this the one I want? Perhaps. Yeah, good enough. We'll use this one. Um, pretty cool thing about SVG is that because the vectors are just math, it's kind of like, uh, remember fractals? If you zoom in on a fractal, what do you get? Right? You get more fractal. It's like the fern that never ends, and you can oh, there's more ferns here. Uh, it's the same thing with, with vectors. If you zoom in on a vector, the math knows what to do. It's going to give you more of that resolution. 
If you zoom in on a canvas object, what do you get? You get bigger pixels. Because it can't give you anything more than that. But it's going to start getting blocky as you zoom in. It's going to start rasterizing. Okay? This is an important distinction. So if you have complex charts that you want to show, or diagrams or things like that, I actually don't like this demo. Let me see if I can find uh, uh, maybe this one. Oh, this one's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, here's some SVG diagrams. So if you zoom in on these and you know, just ask for more, it's perfectly happy to do that. You can see here, you know, now we can actually start reading some of these things here. I just, I'm just using Internet Explorer to change its resolution mode here. And SVG is perfectly happy to give me that, that increased level of detail. Now, let's try that. I'll simulate Canvas here. So let me back out here. And let me simulate what Canvas would do. So let me zoom in with Windows. This is what would happen in a canvas. Right. You're just going to get bigger pixels, but you're not going to get any more resolution. Okay, so keep that in mind. When you're thinking about canvas or SVG for creating the graphics uh, in HTML5, there are trade-offs. Um, you know, SVG has styling. It can be zoomed. Uh, it uses the DOM. Uh, canvas is very simple. It's a simple API to learn. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can do some pretty cool things. Uh, there's a lot of libraries around that. It's fast with a lot of objects, by the way. So if you have a complex thing that you're rendering out, because those things don't go into the DOM, it keeps things fast and peppy. That immediate mode starts paying dividends because uh, with SVG, all those things have to go into the DOM. And then you have to start traversing those things to find things that you want to modify or work with. And that can add up. Right. If you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a great session I have a link to at the end. Uh, the gentleman's name is Jatinder Man, M-A-N-N. -N. The content here and, and padding and outlines here, it says optimize for large screens here. And if I make the screen a little bit smaller, see it change there? It popped out the descriptions there, it dropped a little bit of the, the padding, and it changed to this, you know, optimize for your netbook. And if I keep going, it's going to do it one more time. If I pop it down to here, you see, look, optimize for mobile. And now it got rid of the table, you know, that side-by-side that -side format altogether. It got rid of the outlines. And it really lets us focus on you know, what's important to us at that resolution for that kind of device. So with one HTML page and different rules in my CSS, I can flexibly adapt to multiple different uh, uses. So you know, maybe putting the ad in line with the content versus uh, on the banner. Uh, or omitting an aside that wasn't critical to the content, uh, just relocating these things. Remember what I mentioned before about the semantic tags not implying where things go on a page? This is why. Because you want to be able to use things like this to put things in the, the space that makes the most sense given what you have to work with. Is the CSS coding long and involved? Or is it actually now, let me more? show you, actually. The CSS is pretty straightforward. If you've never even seen it before, let me show you uh, one example. I think this one, yeah, uh, let's go into here. So this one, uh, <laughs> the hand demo, I love this one. Uh, so it's the hand, and as the hand gets less real estate, it drops fingers. <laughs> okay, so I know, highly business you know, usage and you know, put in production today, right? But um, it's a good because the, the source is very straightforward. So we fire it up here, and again, it's from Giorgio, uh, Giorgio Sardo. The, the code here is it's very straightforward. Uh, let me show you the, the bottom here. Lines, you know, 57 to 60. That's that's the core of the document. This is basically setting up a box that we're saying, well, I don't have any default content. I'm waiting for CSS to tell me what to do with this. And the CSS has been written in a way that adapts to the different devices that might be, or sorry, the dimensions of the devices that are hitting our site. And if you've never seen CSS before, take a look at this. I mean, we got a class of box. So we're saying apply rules. Uh, we can apply rules that, that work off that name. And the way we do that, we define a style and we say, look for anything that has a class of box. Dot means class name, and then find the box. And then apply these rules. Well, you don't really need me to tell you what these things are doing. Right? It's putting in that, by default, it's going to put up the, the thumb, right? the one. And then the other thing that you don't need me to tell you how it's working is line 16. This is the actual media query. It's the same kind of CSS rule, context with more context around the specifications of the media. So we just say if you know there's there's width, there's different kinds of things that we can uh, analyze about that device, about the capabilities. This also includes usage. 
So you could look for things like, is it being displayed on the screen? Is it being printed? Uh, in those cases, maybe you want to sneak in an ad or something when they print it or whatever you're trying to do. Right? You can do that though, and you don't have to have a specialized page of HTML to do that. It's just using these classes appropriately. Oh, it's really, really powerful stuff. Yeah. So you're saying that's what's going from the first, uh, the thumb, the second. It's yes. It's just determining that line when it gets between 450 and 500. Right. So the way it's, it's that's exactly right. So this is the default, the first, the first rule undecorated by anything. Mm -hmm. And then the page knows that, oh, if, if the media changes, <coughs> you see here, we can apply various looks. So, you know, for anything over 700 pixels, show the whole hand, and that's it. So replace that in your mind with anything else you want to do, how you're showing your posts, uh, you know, your admin screen, whatever you're trying to do, the About Me page. Um, in fact, for more food for thought, here's a fantastic site. Uh, it's called Media Queries with the dot before the ES, very, very fancy, right? It's the Web 2.0 thing. Um, but the cool thing about this site is it's constantly updated. They do a great job of pointing out uh, you know, real production uses of media, of media queries uh, to affect, uh, to realize a design. So you can see, I never know what I'm gonna see here, so uh, <laughs> I apologize in advance, but uh, it's usually pretty good stuff. So. Um, but you can see here, like any of these, and these are live sites, you can click right through to them and try it out. But you can see how they optimize their content based on whatever they have available to them. I love baking. Yeah. So hopefully it gets you thinking about what you could do with your own blogs, with your own sites, with your own content uh, around optimizing for yeah, someone hitting your site with a mobile browser, a mobile device that doesn't have the width that someone else might be able to, to see on their desktop or laptop machine. Now that's just part of CSS3. That's one of the modules there. Uh, supported uh, IE9, all the major browsers out there, and uh, you can take advantage of so that. If you have IE7, browser. what are you going to see? Ah, good question. So the question was, what if someone doesn't have a latest browser? What's going to happen? So let's let's segue into that. Uh, I do have kind of directly around that uh, by hand. Where, where can we find that? Where is the hand? Yeah, we're seeing. Oh, you know what? That is um, the the hand is is. I gotta make sure I have a link for it. If I don't, I'll put it on my post. But, um, oh, I've lost my IE now. I think, uh, I look for oh, Giorgio. I think Giorgio's got it, yeah. Uh, I will link to this from my post if I don't already have it. But Giorgio has it on his site. Let me Just see. Just go back I, right there for a second. See, there it is. GiorgioSardo.com. Just look for HTML5 demo pack. And you can find them. Uh, but I'll link to that from my site, and he's got these things here, so from various things on SVG, Canvas, all the way down to the media query sample, stuff like that. And where was the hand in that? Uh, it's the media query sample down here, right there under CSS3. Uh, and Giorgio is actually, he's on the IE9 team, on the IE team, so uh, he knows of which he speaks. And there's other things too as well in media, in, in casting style sheets, you know, uh, just around a lot of things that we can do. There's some great sites that show you how to do things, uh, you know, transitioning between one state to another, uh, transforming content by rotating it or skewing it or scaling it different ways. These are all things that we can do to affect change on, on the content side of what we're, what we're displaying. And the good news is there's a lot of support for these things out there today for major browsers. So let's move on. I want to show you the, the next phase here, though. Let's talk about how these things apply to WordPress. So you've seen the major components. You've seen what people tend to talk about in HTML5. There's a, there's a bit more out there. There's, there's things around uh, web forms and stuff like that. I just had to chop out because we only have so much time. Um, but let's talk about how things are making their way into WordPress now. Um, the good news is it's kind of already getting baked in for us. So if you look today, and I'll walk through this for you, you can see how the, the themes now are implementing these new concepts. Semantic markup, the doc types, things like that are making their way in there already. Um, and What's more, is there's already backward compatibility in these, these themes as well to support, you know, what if I'm hitting a site in IE7 or something that was developed long before the concepts that are created in, in HTML5. The good news is, again, because we are paving the cow paths here, um, these problems have been solved for a long time. The things that we're offering as functionality, there's been ways to do most of them, not all, most of them, for a while. If you look at things like jQuery, 
you know, Dojo, you know, JavaScript libraries that are out there. Uh, these things exist to, to add functionality, to, to make more capable experiences uh, in a way that well, we're not spending all our time figuring out how to make it work for every browser out there. That's what they do. So we can turn to those as fallback mechanisms. And what I'll do is I'll show you how that works. So let's take a look, though. I actually want to go through a demo here. And to, to do that, I can bring up, um, let's see. Uh, time's a little short, but let me just create a site really quickly. If you haven't seen this tool, I want to recommend it to you. Um, WebMatrix is a free tool that we have for creating websites on Windows. So if you're running a PC, um, this is a free thing. It's a quick download, and it supports um, you're both ASP sites, but also supports PHP-based sites, too. So including WordPress and uh, other kinds of applications, too. So if you go oh, where it lives, it's right here. Um, just go to Microsoft WAC Web, and Web Matrix is front and center there. Again, it's a free, it's a lightweight environment for you know, PHP or .NET uh, applications. Um, and it really is it's quite nice. There's a, a new beta of version 2 out there that I would recommend. It actually has support for HTML5 uh, markup and CSS attributes and things like that uh, uh, rules built in so you can get IntelliSense for those things that you're typing. So pretty neat stuff. Um, and I'll just show you how to create a quick site with it and uh, wherever I put it. There it is. So I can go through and create um, you know, a new site using you know, whatever. And you can search through blogs, CMSs, whatever. WordPress is right here. Just say, you know, Boston WP and create a site. And it's going to walk you through everything. If you didn't have everything that you needed, it would, you know, install MySQL, it would install PHP, the IIS extensions, the, this MySQL bridge, whatever you need on a machine. It'll take care of that for you. So I just say, of course I read this fully and <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> uh, my unique phrase is super secret, so I'll take that. Installing WordPress it should only take like a little bit of time. Uh, it's going to, I already have MySQL installed, so it's going to point to that. There we go. Got our stuff wired up. Are you say, locally? Yeah, this is a local install. Um, and we're, the web matrix will help you publish to a provider, whatever host you find, or it can help you find one too. So this um, is easier than WAM? Easier than WAM? I haven't used. Uh, you mean, WAM server? Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't be fair for you, though. This, uh, the idea, I mean, I don't mean to make a session on this. Uh, I could come back at some point, but uh, the, the real idea is just to keep it as easy as possible for folks to make websites if they have Windows. And that's the story. So um, I got the site. I can hit Run. And here's my local. Oh, we got to set it up. So uh, here we'll go. Awesome WordPress. Sure, we'll take all the bad practices of keeping admin and stuff like that. Uh, oh, goodness. Let's see if I can type a password here. I gotta, I gotta use their rules here. Did I mash them? Okay, good, they mashed. There's the battle. All right, C Bowen, Microsoft, me. I won't publish it, but I turn that off anyway. Just in case. All right, good. We're logging in. Admin. Uh, what did I use? <laughs> okay, remember me. And bam, we are now in. Uh, so we're gonna be using the default. Uh, 2011 theme that's in here. So if I go right to the site and see here, and here we go. We got our, our basic WordPress site. Now, if I right click, let's take a look at the source here. Let me blow this up a bit. What do we, what comes to mind first of all? Right there. This is good. Right. This is setting us up for browsers that know what this HTML5 thing is to do their job. So now, I can automatically I can go ahead and start using the things I was mentioning before. Uh, and a browser that understands this will be able to take advantage of that. And you're also noticing some other things. If older browser, right? <laughs> By the way, these things don't work in IE9 anymore. These are only specifically for before IE9. Um, so if you're doing browser detection, you know, that's kind of an old way of doing it. I'm going to talk about the preferred way or generally accepted way going forward of feature detection. And I'll show you a cool library to help you do that. But this is, this is as it is. So the library is saying, hey, if it's one of these, we need to uh, identify it as such so we can use some of the plugins to help make these things work in said older browser. OK, so we move on here. But what do we start seeing? Let's take a look down here. So we've got the things that take care of some of our fallback. Um, now, I will talk about that, too. So 
I'm going to start taking a look down here. Uh, I want to point out a couple things here as soon as I find it. The, the font has gotten huge on me. because I. Here we go. Here is some HTML5. Look at that. A header and an H group. It turns out this is a fantastic use of HTML5. H group is one of these, these things you don't really hear about. People talk about HTML5 as often. Uh, H group allows us to use, you, you know what headers are in HTML, right? Uh, we can say this is the H1 level, is the, basically the title of our page, and then H2 are you know, subtitles and things like that. It's all well and good, but the problem is with syndicated content, um, you don't always know where that content's going to be inserted into a page. Is it going to be at the H2 level, H3 level? Is there already going to be header tags at the same level you're inserting? Now, that's not a problem technically, but it's a problem from search engine perspectives. If you have multiple H1s uh, on your page, they're going to assume you're trying to game the system. They're going to start penalizing you. Right? So how do you say, well, this is the most important header for this content, regardless of where it is uh, included in another page? And that's something HTML5 can do for us. This is really cool, because when you use one of these semantic elements, the counting starts over. So I can include something from a, you know, a database of, of entries that I want to put on a page. And I can use h1, h2 on the page itself. And I can still use h1, h2 in the posts because these things just work. Now, the other thing that's cool is H group. It allows us to say, um, don't make the hierarchy of these things. These are both related to each other. H1 is the, the title, and H2 is the subtitle. But they are collectively the header of this content. OK? That's a cool, that's a very cool use of the HTML5 features. And that's exactly what it's for. So it's now baked into the 2011, I think it's, what is it, V1, G, it tells us if you go to one. Um, but the latest version that's, that's baked in for us here. And if you take a look down the list, you're going to see even more of this stuff. There's our nav section. Now, this is really cool, too. So nav has our links in there. It has links, and properly, it has links within our site, how to get around our site, about us, content, news, things like that. Um, but it also, you might be wondering what the role is. This comes from another set of standards for accessibility uh, called ARIA, A-R-I-A. And this helps us to help even further beyond our tags to, to tie into this other spec, too, that's, that's, that's there to help uh, define your intent. So while we're transitioning into this, this semantic tag world, there is also this even richer set of specifications around area, which helps us to say, well, this is, area, this is navigation. This is going to work um, uh, in different scenarios as well. But the point is we want to do as much as we can to help with accessibility. And if that means using a tag and slapping a roll in a couple places, well, I, I hope you think that's not too much work. Sure, it, it makes a big difference, folks. I, I tend to get on a, on a soapbox about accessibility. But uh, it's so, uh, you know, it's very little work that you have to do to make a, a world of difference to a lot of folks out there. So, um, but the cool thing is, on WordPress, it's already built in. That's pretty neat. So, you look through, you can start seeing some of these things built in there. Okay. Um, now, let me, let me point out how this stuff works. So there's, oh, there's our article, by the way. So the article itself has its own header. As I mentioned before, um, these things can nest. And there's the H1 there, regardless of the fact there's other H1s on the page. So that's fine. Um, articles you can think of as units of syndicatable content. So things that, at the highest level, you can think of a section of being a big part of the newspaper, sports, leisure, entertainment, those kinds of things, and article tags being the actual articles within that section. There are exceptions. There are murky waters of the discussions around these. But that's, if you think about it at that level, you're not too far off. Right. So we're seeing this here. Um, this is great. Um, and let me show you back here, though. If we go into themes. Um, we see we are running 2011 uh, version 1.2. And this is exactly what we saw. So we, we already have support for HTML5 semantic markup. We've got some scripts in there, well, which I didn't point out. Um, I run, actually, let me run the page, and I'll show you the actual running page again. Uh, where was it? Did I close it? No, I closed it. Let me run it again. Let me just bring up the tools here, um, dev tools, just to see what's going on in the script here. So there's a script that's running here. Um, show you a little bit what's going on. Uh, am I on the right page? Oh, it might be embedded. Oh, it is. Um, let me just give you the short version, because we are short on time, and I don't want to keep you too long. Um, 
the short version is there's some JavaScript in the page already. Um, oh, I know I wasn't there. I wasn't running as IE uh, early. So um, I'm running as IE 9 right now, which is fully HTML5. I mean, it's going to do all this stuff. It's no problem. If I turn back the hands of time and tell it that I'm IE 7, it's going to change things up for me automatically. And, and here is the file that I was talking about. It's, it's really hard to read, but let so, me try formatting a bit for us. Um, it's, it's not going to be all that easy to, to digest, but I want to make sure you knew that it existed. And let me zoom in just a little bit. I don't, <laughs> this is not, don't, don't read it through. I'm just going to point out a couple things. Right here, those things should look familiar, right? Semantic tags, markup, HTML side stuff. The problem is, with early versions of IE, it has no idea what these things mean. And if it doesn't know what it means, when you try to tell it to do things with it, it, it can't. It doesn't do anything with it. If you try to apply styling or give it a size dimension, it doesn't do that because it's not part of what it knows. So there's actually what's called a shim out there that's already part of what's here. Uh, 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 Remy, Remy Sharp uh, has a shim out there that does this magic of, of creating the elements in JavaScript. And now automatically, magically, uh, you can apply styles and stuff to things that even the browser didn't know existed. So that's what's going on here. That stuff's already wired up for us. And so we can start to use these things and, and even if someone hits your site with IE7 or something like that, the fact that you're using section, article, things like that, will not bring things to a, a halt. Right. That, that's a pretty neat feature, too, because not everyone's running IE9. So uh, just make sure you're, that you're aware of that. Now, the other thing to point out, there's all kinds of other uh, versions, themes out there that have support. And um, I, I like this post. I have, a, I have a link to it at the end. Uh, a presentation, and um, they go through and they talk about 20 free themes that are utilizing some degree of HTML5 for WordPress. And it's really interesting to go through. Uh, Yoko's gotten a lot of, of, of discussion around CSS3, stuff like that. But interesting to you know fire up the template gallery, uh, take a look at some of these, do some view source analysis of them, and see what they're doing because you can start using these things. And as I mentioned before. There are things that are generally plugged into these that will help you to fall back to support older browsers, or non-HTML5 browsers. So, and again, you can look through all these, you know, 2010.5, and all those that are that are out there. Um, we can also bring up the site itself again. Where's the website for that? Uh, I have a link for it um, at the end. I had to bit because it was kind of long, but uh, I'll give it to you in a second. Um, but here, if you go into your themes, you can go ahead and you, can, you know start looking for themes. You know, just a, oops. HTML5, search, oh, no, sorry, I don't want to do it that way. I want to install a theme and search for HTML5 here. If you search here, you're going to find you know, anyone that's mentioned it. Um, toolbox is actually kind of, oh, I'll install it. Go ahead, install it. Toolbox is really a, a minimal, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't try to do a lot for you uh, yeah, from a look and feel perspective. Oh, sorry, I didn't activate. Thank you for catching that. Okay, good. Thank you for catching that. Back to the site. Um, this is HTML5, but it's, it's basic for a purpose. It wants to give you the flexibility to put your own CSS onto it and make it exactly what you want without being confused by someone else's vision of, of what CSS can do. So, but it is HTML5. You do the whole view source. You'll see all the elements and everything there. Um, so anyhow, the, the short version is there are themes that are emerging that are doing these things. It's also a nice article that tells you how to take an existing theme and add HTML5 into it. I like, I like this post a lot, and I have a link to it as well, designszz.com, and I'll, I'll give you a link to this. But they walk through and they talk about HTML5 and how to open up header PHP and stuff like that and add in semantic markup, add fallback to the shim and stuff like that to help with those scenarios. So again, I'll, I'll give you a link to that as well. So whether you want to find a theme that already is embracing HTML5 or work on adding it yourself. Um, there's, there's various options for those. A, a couple things, I'm gonna wrap up with a couple of, of sites for you. Can I use.com? Really useful. You go here, you can look by feature, by browser, by version, and find out which browsers and what versions are supporting those features. And give you an idea of, if I use this feature, how, what percentage of users will be able, or which users can actually utilize that, that capability. And that also gives you some hints, uh, oftentimes, about some ways that you can supply functionality 
for those down-level browsers um, in those cases. And so that leads us into the discussion of Modernizer. Uh, if you haven't heard about this, it's definitely worth uh, taking a look. Uh, Modernizer, no last E, uh, is a free JavaScript uh, library you download, and it does feature detection. And basically what you do is write some JavaScript, or in CSS you can do this as well, but you basically say, if modernizer.canvas.borderradius.fontface, uh, whatever feature you're trying to see if it's supported by the current browser, it will tell you yes or no, and you can then react to that by either you know, working with that feature or having some kind of fallback. Okay, fantastic, fantastically useful. Uh, Modernizer.com, no E on the end. It's on my blog post as a link already. And um, uh, <laughs> an overly clever, clever title here, but uh, these aren't really friendly titles, uh, polyfills and shims, but they are your friends. If you're out there looking for HTML5 and you see these terms come up, they're there to help provide functionality for browsers that don't natively support that feature. And that's really what the, the crux of the matter is here. So they can supply geolocation to a browser that doesn't support geolocation, uh, web form support, validation, client side, uh, things like that. Um, there are polyfills and shims to help you get those features out there. In particular, there's a great list of them that I have a link to, um, which goes through a whole lot of them out there. And I'll put that up at this last slide for you as well. It's on my blog post, but it's, um, it is here. It's this whole list of, of uh, shims and polyfills and stuff like that. Just to show you that you know, if I'm using SVG, is there a way to fall back in earlier versions of a browser that don't support it? it turns out there, there is. There's some options out there. Um, but anyway, I just want to point that out there. I don't have time for a demo. I already showed you IE test drive, which gives you a chance to look at IE 9 and 10. Here's kind of links to the other stuff, though. This was the, uh, the post on how to convert theme or how to begin to convert by adding in HTML content in HTML5 content into a WordPress site. And then there's 20 free WordPress themes, uh, good posts. Also, I didn't mention this yet, but w3conf.org has a recording of a colleague of mine, Ray Bango, R-E-Y, Bango, and he walks through this entire session about these polyfills and shims. So if you're, you're really, you should be concerned about these things. So if you want to know more about how to have fallback functionality for older browsers, if you want to use these newer features, that's uh, definitely a good thing to spend some time learning. And again, that's Ray Bango, R-E-Y. Uh, he's got a good site. Uh, if, you want, if you like that matrix, uh, it's really easy to learn. You can download it there. And again, most of these links are already on my blog there. So that is it. Thanks very much uh, for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, come on up and ask I'll leave that up for you.